Hi everyone, it's Jessica Curson. Of course it's me. Why would I even say that in the beginning of the podcast? I'm really trying to like forgive myself and not annoy myself a lot. So it's fine that I just did that. I'm not going to obsess about it. I mean, what's the big deal? If I say my name in the beginning, it's okay. I really shouldn't even be thinking about it. You know, it's fine. I, I, it's Jessica Curson. This is Relatively Sane. I'm so grateful to you guys for listening to my podcast. I want to reach out and say hello to my friends in Guam. Um, I want to reach out to the Eskimos in Alaska. And I want to reach out to all of my listeners in Kiev. I don't even know where that is. Is that in Russia? So I know, you know, I went for a master's degree and I don't know a lot. I don't know a lot about geography. I don't know a lot about history. I know about the Holocaust, that's for sure. Seems like a lot of millennials don't even know what the Holocaust is. They don't even know who Anne Frank is. And she was an amazing dancer in the 1950s. It's unbelievable. I'm so grateful for this podcast Listen, are you a Patreon member? You should be. I'm putting up extra podcasts on Patreon. I'm doing, I put videos up that no one sees anywhere else. It's $5 or $8. You know, I hate doing this shit, but I have to do it. And some people are ruthless with promoting themselves. And I really should be because I'm going to seven therapists right now. And I have a lot of bills I have to pay. I started going to this ART therapy, which is amazing. It's unbelievable. It's like the eye movement stuff, except I went to a new woman the other day and she moved her finger so fast back and forth that I almost had a seizure and ended up in a mental institution. It didn't work. I can't move my eyes that fast. It's really incredible though. Look it up, ART. It stands for accelerated... um, uh, robot training. I don't know. I can't remember what it stands for, but you should really check it out. And I'm also doing a lot of breathing stuff and meditation and I feel good. And guess what? I haven't had sugar or flour in, I think nine days now. And I feel so much better. I mean, I'm fucking starving. Like I'm literally going to eat my furniture, but I feel better emotionally. I cannot eat sugar. I can't. And I know a lot of you have the same issue. I just can't do it. Do you know that I started eating? I'm I'm going to be honest because this is my podcast slash radio show slash bitch session. I was buying at the same time gummy bear, a bag of gummy bears and a bag of the sour cherry gummies. And I was eating both bags at a time. I was eating sweet tarts. I was eating like the sour patch thing. My mouth is watering now. I swear I just said sour patch and my mouth started watering. I mean, if that's not an addict, what is? I had to give it up. You know, if even if I'm not doing drugs or alcohol, I if I'm doing something else that makes me feel out of control and changes who I am as a person. I have no idea what I just said, but I know a lot of you understand what I just said. I can't do it. I just can't. And there's certain things I don't binge on. And then there's some things I just can't have a little of. I just, I really can't. So you guys are the best. Thank you for following me. Don't forget to follow me on Twitter at Jessica Curson, on Instagram at Jesse Curson. Facebook, I have a fan page, which is so, it's so great. I have like almost 79,000 people on my Facebook fan page and I love it. I love, you know, posting things on there and interacting with you guys. I hope you're well, take care of yourselves, wear a mask. I love you all. Please enjoy this episode. Hi, everyone. Welcome to Relatively Sane. I am here today with one of my favorite people. I really mean that. I just love him. And I love what he does on stage and all the things he creates. Um, I'm so grateful to have you. Please welcome Jeff Ross. Oh, my God. Thank you for that nice introduction. Um, Jessica, I feel the same way about you. You're, you're a good friend and a, a talented person. Oh my God. Was that your stomach or was that the dog? 
Hi. I th- oh, oh, it's chasing its tail. Wait, I haven't be- seen that one. No, this is a new one I just got. <laughs> to keep oh, the other one. Smart. There are two Nazis. One's a puppy. Okay. <laughs> All right. Explain. You have two full-bred German shepherds? Yeah, it's a total fluke. Total what happened? Um, in the beginning of quarantine, um, my girlfriend and I wanted to get a second dog because the shelters were closing up for the staff wanted to go home. Yeah. And she so kept seeing online that, you know, we needed to, we needed to take a dog in. It was, it was, it was, it was This is hilarious for people just listening. Like, it's it's the funniest sound that they're hearing. It's It's literally a 10-month-old German Shepherd chasing her tail and looking at herself in the mirror, probably for the first time in her life, being totally confused. Hilarious. Why does she have a swastika in her fur? (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Hold on. Let me me get them out of here. No, it's okay. I might have my kids walk in. I'm serious. There's going to be all kinds of sounds. I don't care. I like the sound, actually. Get up here, kids. Jeff just got out of his chair to reprimand the Nazi dogs. This is what happens when you do comedy at home. You know? I know. I told you my kids are going to probably make noise. What? What? It, what are their names? The big one is Nana. So we got her right in the beginning of quarantine. And at first I called her Rona because it was Corona and you didn't know any better. Yeah. And, and then as I got to know her personality and seen that she'd had a lot of puppies and Aww. she's kind of blind and she has no bottom teeth. So I changed it to Nana. I just called I... her Nana. <laughs> I love the name Nana because she has like, she can't see and she has no teeth. That's amazing. And, um, and she's my, I love her. Like I really honestly thought I could never love this dog. She smells, she was jittery. Mm-hmm. She, she was just like, she was just gross. <laughs> yeah, I, sounds gross. She was found tied up to a telephone pole in Hawthorne, California, in the beginning of uh, oh COVID. My God. Oh. So. How old uh, is she? How old do you think she is? The, the vet says double digits, which means she could go anytime. And she does have cancer in her back legs. Holy um, shit, Jeff. This is why, this is, I'm going to tell everyone, this is why I said that I love you. It's not. It's not because of who you are, or I think you're brilliantly talented, but most people, in fact, I don't know one person that would take in a dog in that kind of condition. <laughs> I'm shocked you're not a lesbian. <laughs> well, in some circles, I would be known as a lesbian. That's but, true. We do do um, the same things. So, and, and I am wearing a Gaga t-shirt, so you know I support all people of all... Um, of all um, I know it's hard to come up with the right thing to say. You support dykes and fags. I Everyone. can say it. Yeah. <laughs> and then Nana, as as I like at first, she couldn't even walk down the stairs. She was too weak, and I changed her meds, and I got her a good vet, and she got a little love and walks, and she's actually getting younger, even though she's old. And and then the vet called me and mm-hmm. said. Listen, this puppy just came in. This was a month and a two months ago. Oh. That, that I think would be good for Nana. She's a submissive German Shepherd, and Nana could it'll keep her Nana youthful. Right. So they brought a second German Shepherd over to see how they got along, and they were playing right away and sharing a bowl. And normally Nana would not play and share like that. Right. For the she's like street dog, but she immediately loved this dog and Nipsey. And Nipsey just nips at her all day long and keeps her going and they wrestle and they fight and they snuggle and, and, I, and, and they're besties. And, you know, you saw them playing, but now they're just snoozing again. Oh, they're both out. They were just jumping all over each other. Yeah. So That's they love so attention funny. and they, I, I'm, I'm really learning to, I'm learning stuff about myself. I've never had a dog, you know, I'm in my fifties. I've never, this is my first dog's. Why did you never have, that's so interesting to me. How come you never had a dog? Did you not want one or? When we were little, 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 a a Doberman bit my sister. So we were a little skittish. And we had a puppy when I was really young and 
and cats too. And my, my parents always said I was allergic and I would be wheezing. And uh, I was told not to get dogs my whole life. And then all, once I had nephews, my sister's like, I'm getting a dog. And I was like, you don't love me. You don't want me to visit. You know, I'm allergic. <laughs> it became a huge issue. And then, then it just happened. My girlfriend had a dog and I loved the dog and I couldn't imagine life without dogs now. So yeah, you're um, such a dog person. You really are. Like some I, people are just dog people. Yeah, these dogs. I always make up backstories because they're just they're just rescues. You don't know what the hell happened to them. So I'm always like, yeah, this is Nana. She uh, you may recognize her from a uh, <laughs> stunt dog. She got hit by a bus at Air Bun Three. <laughs> That's hysterical. You're giving your dogs credits. Yeah. This is Nipsey. You might recognize her. She uh, tortured some uh, detainees in Zero Dark Thirty. <laughs> I love that. So you should tell everyone that Nana won the Westminster Dog Show. <laughs> in the won- condition she's in. Yeah. She just she- won it two years ago. And she's <laughs> she's funny. Like, you know, she limps. And she's blind and she has no bottom teeth, but she's a hundred pounds. She's ferocious. Looking. Yeah, she's big. So we'll Sounds walk like me. The, <laughs> I we'll feel... walk down the street and she'll start barking at other dogs. But it's a little bit like Fred G. Sanford, you know? And yeah. uh, what was that show? Uh, Sanford and Son. She'd be like, all right, come on now. Here we go. <laughs> I'll get you. I'll go. <laughs> Is she good dog. with people? Like when you have friends over? She's good in parties. Like if there's 10 people in the backyard, she's great. But if one person comes over, she'll bark at them. That's so weird. And 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 I have to. I've learned the spray bottle um, method, mm-hmm. and that it works. To work. It really does work. And 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 if anything romantic's happening, that she gets mm-hmm. very jealous and will interrupt. Oh, and, that you don't want that a hundred pound dog jumping into the bed or on the sink. Or do you? <laughs> 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 that was part of the description. <laughs> yeah, it's been very doggy around here, and yeah. uh, everything revolves around the dogs. They don't understand why I don't have a job. Why don't I, you know? They don't understand that I'm a comedian, and I, they're my whole act now, and I, my, they're my audience. Like without regular touring, I don't know what it's going to be like. I, 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 the trainer that I've been talking to said I had to crate the baby Nipsey, so that when I do go back on tour she'll be used to being left alone. Whereas right now they just see me as, as this guy who's here all the time. Yeah. Crating is hard. I mean, Oh God, I know you have to do it. I've, I have such a hard time reprimanding my kids. I've actually been working on that in therapy because I project onto them. Like if I'm like, don't do that. I'm like, Oh my God, they're going to be damaged. They're going to end up eating a lot. And it's, I it's, it's hard, but crating works. It really does. Yeah, well, I, 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 it's hard for me not to spoil them because they're both rescues. And I wanted Nipsey to feel like she was home and life was spring break for a couple months. But my hands hurt. She's biting me. She keeps shitting in the garage. She like, she's bad. She's eating everything. So I Why have, is she shitting in the garage? What's in the garage? garage? She thinks the garage is outside for some reason. Like I've got well, her to go outside and yeah. you know, learn to open the doors. She's really smart. Wow. Well, everyone's confused now. I've shit in the garage um, a bunch since COVID started, too. It's we're all <laughs> we, we all don't need know. <laughs> we don't know where we can go. <laughs> Safe spaces. <laughs> I shit in my closet a lot now. Um, just it's kind of I don't know. It's psychological. It's I, I was think you came out of the closet. for your Yeah, shit. I'm back in the closet and I'm shitting in it because I wish I wasn't gay. <laughs> um, Jeff, are you doing any stand up at all? No, I, I, I no, I, 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 it, I can't believe after 31 years. Oh my God. But it's been a good test for me. You know, it's been a, how about you? I am doing it at, not a lot, but I'm doing it, but I don't, I don't know. I'm enjoying other things more than stand up right now. Artistically, you know, I just, I, I miss it and I don't. Mm. Do you feel like that too? I miss the comics. Yeah, me too. Fans. I don't miss being on stage. I love being on stage, but I don't. I don't have that. It's not a drug to me like it is for other people. 
Me either. I mean, there's it was for a long time in the beginning, but then I was like, Jesus, I'm tired. This is it's, it's so much energy to even before the show and after, and it's it's. I could, I could get the same laughs FaceTiming with my sister, <laughs> and that's enough for me. You know that that yeah. satiates the desire to to be funny and. And I'm in, instead of texting, I've been FaceTiming more people and I've been doing some social distance, um, you know, socializing with my friends and just getting a few laughs with my buddies reminds me of who I am and that I'm funny and I could cheer up anybody and I call sick friends and, and I, that part of being a comedian will never go away. But, you know, I just went to Nashville for the weekend just to see old friends. And oh. I walked right by the comedy clubs. It was like, I, I felt nothing. I was okay. That's so interesting. I feel very similar to the way you do. It's hard to be funny now, and it's hard to come up with material. Yeah. It's all the same yeah. shit, right? The same COVID jokes and Trump jokes. and. Yeah, what are you going to talk about? I mean, it's not like we're any of us are living. We're barely living. We're barely getting out of bed and functioning. Here's my one joke will be good. Like, yeah, let me hear you'll, it. You'll understand this. Like, comedy will come back. Music, live performance will come back. Here's the live performance that will never come back, who I really feel sorry for, Jessica. The close-up magic. <laughs> Pick a card. Pick your own fucking card. I'm not touching those fucking dirty <laughs> cards. Get your hand out of my ear, you creepy magician. I, there's no quarter in my fucking ear. <laughs> That's so true. And you, and it's like you have to, even if you're, you have to slice the woman in the box. I mean, there's all kinds of things you have to do that are hands-on. I mean, puppets could work. Yeah, puppets could work. Ventriloquism, I guess. And, but I don't know what's going to happen. I, I My prediction is that comedy will come back bigger than ever. If you have one show in New Jersey, you'll suddenly be doubling up to two shows because everybody's going to want that release. We're living in a hugless I, world. Like, people need it. They need it. And a lot of people are afraid to even go. Even if there's shows going on, people are afraid to go, which is understandable, and sit in the audience. And my act is, like, I bring people on stage. and like I to, know. I, I like to be connected. Roasting somebody 30 feet away is mean, but when you, you can pat them on the shoulder and they can give you a hug after a, or a fist bump, that's, like... The intimacy is what I need to get those to get those laughs. I feel the exact same way. I did governors on Long Island with Attell yeah. and they had put up like that plastic thing around us. <laughs> it was crazy. I have to send you a picture of it. It's like a phone booth. And I felt so uncomfortable because I'm so intimate with the audience and I love doing crowd work. And so does he. So it was a very weird feeling. It was very depressing to me to, to be behind However, this. However, putting plastic around a tell is not a bad idea. <laughs> <laughs> Between the smoke fumes, the stench of homeless, je ne sais quoi. <laughs> yeah, Jeff, I went up after him. Like, he introduced me. And it's the whole thing was covered in, like, jizz and and marks and skid marks there was shit all over the plastic and i'm like this is very offensive <laughs> the truth is it got it was outside in a tent so it got very like i had to wipe it down to see people oh it got steamy yes interesting it feels weird you know the seller has that up right now i mean it's i don't know if that's what all their stages are going to be like but they do have the plastic surrounding I'm saying it wrong. It really makes a difference. Like, there's, there's the comedy store is, is having outside seating, right? Yeah. So people will perform in the window and they can see the audience, but they can't hear them. But the audience has a speaker outside, they can hear the comic. But down the street, two buildings, <clears throat> there's a bar called the, uh, uh, oh, it's like a roadhouse place. Whatever. I know what you're talking about. Like a cowboy bar, Saddle Ranch. Saddle Ranch. Uh -huh. And they have hundreds of people in the parking lot and they're allowed to do that. But as soon as the comedy store wants to add one person with a sanitized mic, that's illegal. Yeah, I don't understand the whole thing. I really don't. It, 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 the thing I've been thinking about is it's going to weed out a lot of comics. Yeah. 
you know, people who have a career and have a following will be fine. But people who are in their first 10 years, I, I don't know how they're going to, it's going to take years longer, I think. And a lot of people are getting left behind and comedy clubs are closing and staff is getting laid off. And, you know, maybe this is small compared to the bigger issues of author authoritarianism and, and death because <laughs> of COVID. I, mean, I know. It's crazy. And I know it is in New York too, but you know, the comics are an important voice in this country as news yes. becomes more and more compromised and, uh, and subjective and comics are the truth tellers. They are the, the true journalists. And when you take the stages away, I think the country suffers. I do too. I fully agree with you. And I have experienced people getting on both sides, trying to silence me and, you know, getting offended by things that are like about my life. Like I'll talk about something about my relationship or having kids and people will get very offended. I'm like, I'm talking about myself. What does this even have to do with you? It's so insane. It The whole thing is so insane to me. It's but like, it used to be, if you tweet something, you're tweeting it to your followers. Now you're tweeting it to all, everyone who wants to shit up, sh slap back at, if your agenda doesn't line up with their agenda. It well, Twitter sense. is evil. I think Twitter is, when I want to feel like shit, I'm, I'm being honest, you, I, I know you're going to understand this. I go on Twitter. Like when I want to get into like a bad, like I start reading the political stuff, I start seeing how people are getting all offended and it gets me in the worst mood. Yeah, I, I it just I can't stand it. I mean, one thing I wanted to ask you on a different note, because I, I was thinking about this is what uh, what's one of the worst gigs you've ever had? Like, I just don't know from you. I love hearing from people. Worst gigs. I mean, worst. How? Like the audience was horrific. You got heckled or people walked out i mean i prefer mine are all jewish people they've walked in in droves have walked out of the room <laughs> while i'm performing this is horrible like just walking out of the room <laughs> and, I, remember, I remember performing at a jewish singles event in the catskills 20 yeah, years ago or so. those are bad and you know when i say singles these were more like jewish leftovers like these are the people <laughs> Never find anyone. They would never find love. They were, they were, they were the people who don't deserve love. <laughs> they have we, like one eye, and their shoes are ripped. I don't mind that. It's it was in here. They had no love. Oh, it, in their heart. Okay. Just going to complain. Yeah, and they're single, right? And this was a long, long, long time ago. But it was me and John Stewart, and we were like. <laughs> oh, Jewish singles. Maybe we'll meet our wives at this event. Right? So we go up, we drive up together. I didn't know him well, and he didn't know me well, but we knew each other enough. And and we, John John's wearing a regular dress shirt mm -hmm. and black jeans, and I'm actually wearing a blazer. Yeah. And um, I said, well, man, before we went out, I said, you're pretty brave not wearing a blazer. This is a very judgmental crowd. They're definitely going <laughs> that you didn't like pizzazz it up for their big, big show, big singles weekend. And, you know, I go on and I do my half hour and <laughs> I didn't kill and I, did, I didn't get laughs either. But nobody <laughs> walked out. But you can tell that it was a really hard situation. Yeah, they were and enraged. I'm it's, sweating. I'm sweating through my yeah. sport jacket, but I get through my whole act without any walkouts because at least they can go. He's wearing a blazer. He's a nice Jewish <laughs> boy. We like him. Yeah. Get off stage, and the announcers, you know, uh, oh, oh, whew, I made it. John Stewart looks at me, and they're about to introduce him, and he goes, "Let me borrow your fucking blazer." <laughs> He rolls the sleeves up to make it look a little different, and he walks out there with my <laughs> blazer on. And I got I learned so much that night. You asked about the worst gig. Sometimes the worst gig you learn the most. Yes, you always. He's up there bombing. Yeah. Like walk out indignant people going, "Oh, I didn't come for this. What is he talking about? Politics, yeah. 
fucking his cat and all this other funny <laughs> and 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 what I learned from it was that he knew that he was good he he committed he was confident even though the audience wasn't buying it he had enough experience at that point to know you're either going to come to me or you're not I'm not going to try to win you over and I got so much respect for him watching him not care he was aloof to, or or whatever, indifferent to the fact that people were walking out on him. But he was still doing his thing, full throttle. And I learned a lot, you know, maybe like stick to your guns, don't sell out so easy, and maybe don't don't give in so easy. How was he on the ride home? Be care? <laughs> uh, we both banged a couple 70-year-olds. <laughs> <laughs> we needed the money. <laughs> Thank you so much to all of my Patreon members for supporting the podcast. All right, hold up. Could you take a little off off the P's? You're hitting them too hard. The uh, not uh, action. Thank you so much to all of my Patreon members for supporting the podcast. Hold on, now you're whispering Patreon. Is there a reason oh. you're whispering? Well, you said to take the P. Somewhere like, in the middle. Okay, okay. You ready? Action. Thank you so much to all of my Patreon member. <sighs> Now you got to pause. For those of you who don't know, Patreon members, is that okay? Patre- <laughs> it was perfect. Why'd you stop? Oh, okay. Patreon members. Cut. Let's go back to the beginning. Thank you and so much. And action. Thank you so much to all my Patreon members for supporting the podcast. For those of you who don't know, Patreon members get early access to the podcast, ad free episodes, and access to monthly live streams where we talk more about. All right, let's take it back to the beginning. That was perfect. Do it exactly like that. I just did it well, though, but why are you starting over? Thank you so much to all of my patron. Cut. (sighs) Why are you screaming? Because I'm just trying to get through this. Action. Thank you so much to all of my. Thank you so much to all of my Patreon members. For those of you who don't know, Patreon members get early access to the podcast. Perfect. Keep going. There's so many P's. Keep going. Keep going. Ad-free episodes. You could cut this out, right? For those of you who don't know, Patreon members get early access to the podcast, ad-free episodes, and access to monthly live streams where we talk more about being relatively sane. Hold up. Did we agree on monthly live streams? Yes, you told me I should do them because it'll get more members. I don't know how to do a monthly live stream. Don't you just talk in your phone? Uh, We'll figure it out. Come on, let's get through this. We have to go. We should speed this up. All right. Thank you so much to all my Patreon members for supporting this podcast. For those of you who don't know, Patreon members get early access to the podcast, ad-free episodes, and access to monthly live streams. We don't know what that is, but whatever. Where we talk about being relatively sane. If you want to join our fantastic community that is so corny, go to patreon.com slash Jessica Curson. That's patriot.com slash Jessica Curson. That's patreon. I think you said patriot.com. Go to petroleum. I mean, patreon.com slash Jessica Curson. That's patreon.com slash Jessica Curson. Patreon.com slash Jessica Curson. Thanks again. And cut. That's a wrap. Ugh. I know they're the worst when they're not having fun and they're angry. They look like their dog is being hung in front of them. Like they are enraged, miserable. People and they will walk. I follow Dick Capri. He was like Prince on stage. Like I- I'm not even kidding. He killed so hard, and I had to follow Dick Capri. I it was he. He was the funniest. I couldn't breathe. But I went up and, I, and here I am. This woman. I'm not seasoned. I'm. They can tell I'm a nervous wreck, and I want them to like me. You're. You're so right about that. Like if you can even fake the confidence, you'll. You'll do okay. But mm. he. He killed, and then I went up, and then they started getting up one after, and they're slow because they're so old. You know, I was at a country club, so it's not like they just <laughs> get up and walk out. They were like, ugh, uh, you have the scarf, you know, like it was a whole thing that I had to watch, and I'm not exaggerating. Three quarters of the audience walked out while I was talking. Oh, brutal. How do you not get angry at these people i get uh, sometimes i get like i get so angry because they're my people well your your thing is like you go inside yourself when you're yeah. you're having anxiety or you know you want a, a short thing you go inside yourself it's your classic move right mm-hmm. no one does that but you that i've ever seen you go yeah. inside yourself whereas i maybe it's a um, defense mechanism the same way yours is 
I go outside myself and I go on the attack. Yeah. So if someone tries to get up and go, walk out, I'm all over them. <laughs> I'm going to talk to them until they're out the door. I'm going to, or I'll, or I'll pull them on stage to really like, like land it like a school teacher going, who said that? Come up here. You know, yeah. and next thing I know I'm roasting people and it's funny again. So we all have our little go-to bag of tricks. Yeah. And those people like when you bust on them, actually, that does work with that crowd. Yeah. They yeah. can laugh at themselves. You know, at this point, you and I, we have our audience. If people are coming to see us, they're probably not random. Yeah. They're there That's to true. see, you know, the Curse On show. They're here to see the roast show. They're here yeah. to, they know what they're getting. So, you know, like you said, some comics are going to get left behind in this, but luckily we have a little bit of a reputation. Yeah. Well, how did you get into the whole roast thing? Did that just happen? Like, were you just doing that on stage and then someone said, wow, I mean, at, well, you did at Friars. I mean, that's how, isn't that how did, it really started? I did a uh, golf tournament out in Jersey for the Friars Club. Greg Fitzsimmons, who's a good buddy of mine. He's amazing. His dad was a big Friar, um, big part of the Friars Club, and he passed away. And And every year, Greg would, would do a benefit show for the Friars in honor of his dad, Bob Fitzsimmons, who was a big broadcaster in New York and beloved. And one year he asked me to do it. I knew Greg pretty well. And um, Freddie Roman introduced me at this golf golf outing and he didn't know me. He just kind of gave me this bullshit dismissive <laughs> introduction. And I'm just like innocently going, oh, he's so Freddie Roman. They call him Freddie Roman because you can hear him in Italy. Just nonsense <laughs> jokes about how loud and boisterous he was. And these young, these older guys loved it. Some young whippersnapper was willing to, take the piss out of Freddie Roman, who was the head of the Friars Club. And I remember I had a pretty good set. A few months later, maybe even a few weeks later, Jean-Pierre Trebeau, the French director of the Friars Club, called me up and said, oh, we're roasting Steven Seagal, and uh, we'd like you to be a part of it. I love that. I, I mean, that's how it should be. Like, they see I you do the thing, and then yeah. they, yeah, and then you just started doing a ton of them, right? I started I mean, doing like the roast and then producing the roast because – it was like a lost art. Like mm -hmm. the roasts were corny when I started doing it. They, nobody, no big stars were really signing on anymore. Mm -hmm. So when they told me I could be up there with Milton Berle and Buddy Hackett and Henny Oh Youngton, my God. And that's when like, you know, I was like, all right, well, I don't care about Steven Seagal, but I, I'd love to meet Henny Youngman and Buddy Hackett and Milton Berle. And I started, you couldn't even Google it back then. There was no YouTube. I had to go to the Museum of Broadcasting to even see what these roasts look like and what they were all about because they were very closed off private events at that point right and i wrote way too many jokes but you know i probably hit 60 percent of them probably hit but the ones that hit hit so big that i knew i'd found my yankee stadium if you will those friars roasts my opening joke was to steven seagal i just kind of looked at him and no one knew me i said a lot of people it was like two thousand people at the new york hilton i remember yeah. i've been to them <laughs> I said, a lot of you don't know me, but I feel uniquely qualified to be here today because I'm also a shitty actor. <laughs> Nipsey, stepped on my punchline. This is a huge... Wait, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Oh my God, there must be another Jew in there. Hold on. That's okay. Someone's at the door. It's probably, it's probably, it's probably, it's probably a Jew. Hold on. Everybody out. Give them some, like, a sausage or, or I don't know, pierogies. What the, what the fuck do Hold on. Germans eat? My cousin Ed's here. He's handy. Borscht? Pull him out of here. Come on. Come on. Go ahead, Nipsey. Hi, Ed. Hello. How are you doing? Horrible. How are you? Oh, a little better than you. Oh. <laughs> That's Rambo. That's his dog. Come on. Uh, uh, oh my gosh, that's a tough looking dog too. He's a good guy. Come on. That is fine, but the other two, Nipsey's got to stop barking. Is it because somebody at the door? Yeah. Yeah. Well, the bed's here. Oh. Hey. Bed's here. This is hysterical. This is a dude. That this is a this is a podcast during COVID. This I is what it is. Yeah. This is what it is. All right. Go ahead, Nipsey. She's Why don't you, I don't know. 
Why don't you throw like a? What could you throw at that dog to make him leave? <laughs> he just throw a latka outside or something. Sorry about that, folks. I don't care. That's fine. I'm so be, grateful you're. If you're just tuning in, welcome to Jessica Kurzon's dog roaster. <laughs> <laughs> the dog whisperer show. <laughs> This is, Jeff, hold on. What was your, this is such a big question, but what do you think the funniest roast is that you did? I mean. Well, oh, wow. I know that's a hard, how many have you done? Do you know? Oh, my God. You know, celebrity roasts, I've probably done 30. Oh, my God. But just regular, like, corporate roasts. And sometimes, like, I roasted my Uncle Murray for his, for his 90th birthday. That was a pretty, <laughs> that might have been the funniest one. Because it's family. I said, I said, everyone might not know that Uncle Murray has a big trip planned this summer to the vase on top of the mantle. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, everyone's talking about the Trump roast lately because I roasted him a few times. And there's a lot of good jokes in there that kind of told the future. And uh, I roasted Bieber. That was my favorite, my favorite one ever where it was just so much fun was probably Flavor Flav. Oh, that was hysterical. I had a great opening joke. I said, uh, I don't even want to do this roast. How do you even embarrass a crackhead who wears a Viking helmet? <laughs> <laughs> I know, it's it's a, just look at a picture. Where is Flavor Flav now? <laughs> it, sounds like a, it sounds like a vape, like a vape company. <laughs> Flavor Flav, strawberry vape, I like it. <laughs> For all your, yeah, vaping needs. Yeah, I don't know. You don't see a lot of anybody lately because of, uh, you know, you can't perform. So everybody's getting in touch with their family side these days. Their yeah. Own, their own side. You know, you're lucky you have that big family there to keep you uh, relatively sane during. <laughs> Good during one, life. Jeff. That was, that was, yeah, I like that a lot. Yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting. It's, it's a lot. Um, but I do, it does. I mean, it's so nice to walk into little baby smiling. That's for sure. Yeah. How old are your kids? A 14, 5, and twins, 18-month-olds. Can you believe that? Weird. That's a lot. Huh? Yeah, and I'm, and I'm really like, I call myself like a rapper because I just, I like, you know, impregnated two women. Like, I didn't do anything. <laughs> I didn't even, I mean, I didn't wear a condom, but I, I just like, I never even thought I was going to have kids. Did you ever think you were going to have kids? And do you want I, kids? I, still, I never knew for sure. I know this is going to really sound insane, but having dogs for the first time is preparing me for more. I I swear I knew you were going to say that. I, I totally I, understand. I couldn't even keep plants alive. I was like, <laughs> I can barely remember to take my own thyroid medication. and Right. Shit. And But now that I have... I've been home for the first time in 30 years. I've been not traveling. I'm living in a house. Mm -hmm. um, I haven't stayed home since high school. So I, I know. I'm longing for, for kids. Yeah. I, I don't know what I'll do. I mean, I'm probably going to have to adopt, which is fine. But um, unless I find somebody who wants to do that with me, I don't know. I, I, I just recently started to go, man, I don't want to miss out on that. I mean, adopting is a myth. You know, I met someone recently who was in the foster care system for many years in New York. He was in it for about seven years. And it was like, it was so horrific for him. Mm. The things that he told me that he went through. Oh, Isabella's here. Look, this is my little doggy. She, oh. Come say hi. Hi, hi Isabella. Say hi. Say hi. hi. <laughs> woof, woof, woof. What's up? <laughs> so I, um, you know, he told me these stories and I'm like, oh my God, all these kids who have nowhere to go, who just are, hold on. Yes, honey. 16 months old. Oh, okay. She just corrected me. They're 16 months old. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> if that's not amazing, what just happened? That's going to be that key footage in your child custody here. <laughs> That is unbelievable. She just walked in. She goes, Mama, I go, what? She goes, they're 16 month old twins. Ugh. And walked away. That's how much I know. I'm, I, you know what? It's okay. I, I accept myself. But 
So he was saying that he, it just was horrible for him. And I was thinking, we were talking about it, and there's just so many kids who have nowhere to go. I mean, babies and toddlers, and it's just, and he had this family that took him in, and he's, I mean, now he's 50, and he's like, he has amazing parents, you know? It's, you know, we, we tend to hear the, the good foster care stories. Yeah. Um, God knows the bad ones. Yeah, there are a lot. And I think now there's probably so many kids that, that need to be adopted. If you want, I can have my wife have one for you. I mean, she already had three. This one, Danielle. She's up for, have... up for plopping on another one? Yeah, it doesn't matter. She'll do it if I make her. Um <laughs> You have a lot of friends with kids because a lot of comics don't like a tell these people, you know, a lot of them don't have kids. Um, most of my friends, most of my friends my age have kids. Um, it's just something that didn't even just didn't yeah. even occur to me for a long time. And I'm also like, you know, I just turned 55. And someone oh said, Oh my God, I didn't know that. I thought you were 50. I, yeah. And I honestly have. I feel the same way I felt when I was a teenager. My friends teased me back then that I was old and 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 always kvetching and I was <laughs> this hurt and that hurt. The same shit that hurt when I was eighteen hurts now. I also feel great. Yeah. Like, I I don't long for the old days. Like I still feel very ageless. You know what? I feel like that too now. And I think part of it is being home like this, just being able to be in your own space and not running, 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 you know, especially with your schedule with producing yeah. shows. And it must have been insane for a long time now. I, I'm so I'm really enjoying turning the dial down. Like, I literally am looking forward to walking the dogs after this podcast, saying hi to my neighbors. I know all my postal workers. Yeah. The first time since I was a kid, I know everyone in the neighborhood. The, the next door neighbor brings his puppy over to play with my puppy. Um, my friends come over for dinner. My 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 family like Zoom. I had a Zoom birthday party with all my Jersey family. You know stuff that I just didn't have time for. Didn't even think about for mm -hmm. decades. I'm really enjoying. So part of me goes, how do I move it from having to perform live to wanting to perform live right um yep and i used to say i'm a comedian before i'm anything else and now i'm not so sure i am going through the exact same thing that you just said mm. like i used to say i no, no matter like the only thing that matters is that i can do stand-up that's the number one priority i want to show so that i can sell out crowds and do stand-up and i don't feel like that as much anymore. I mean, I, I love stand up, but I'm not like, it's not the number one thing now. I'd rather create shows and write and do podcasts, like different things, creative stuff. When I was an open micer, I got my first TV slot. And I remember saying to myself, saying it hard and firmly to myself, if I do that, I knew I, I was going to get this TV shot, like eight minutes on Caroline's comedy hour on cable. Mm hmm. But if I do stand up once on TV, I'll be fine not doing it ever again. And I still stand by that. I, I know. Back, I look back at the stuff that I've done and I go, yeah, that was, that, that might be enough. Yeah. Cause you have done, so, I mean, you've done, how many times were you on the Tonight Show? I was on Letterman, the Tonight Show, Conan. I've done a bunch of hour specials, did one from a jail, did one. The one from the jail I love so much, Jeff. I really wanted to, I I, I would love to do that with female, um, I almost just said prisoners, inmates. What do you The word, the word, I learned a lot, even about that I learned a lot. Inmates is fine, prisoners is fine. But what, the best way to talk about it is people that are incarcerated. People, yeah. People. Mm -hmm. And they don't get dehumanized in the same way that they do in the press or by politicians, like people that are locked up. And, you know, I got a, I got a message from one of the Nazis down at Brazos County Jail where I was yesterday, just kind of fucking with me on Instagram. And, you know, it opened up a world of weirdness um, doing those types of shows. But yeah. What did you, what did you get out of that? Like, what? Did you feel scared at all? 
to be in that environment because I would. I'm still scared because now they're writing me on Instagram. And, <laughs> and they all get out. Every ninety percent of everybody in jail is coming out someday. So yeah. I, I'm a big believer in hope and rehabilitation and giving mm -hmm. people a second chance because to pretend these people are going to stay in forever is ridiculous. Everyone's getting out. It's one of the reasons I get behind criminal justice reform. I've been to the White House even during this administration because, you know, pushing for that because if you're in jail for years and years and years and years and years and years for something that's legal now, I know. You don't give a fuck who the president is. You got you want to get out. So I advocate for those people, nonviolent criminals. Yeah, that's so important. It's so upsetting. Every system is so upsetting. I, I really, I mean, like with mental health and oh, I it's there's so many things that I would love to be a part of to try and change. And I, I think it's great that you're doing that. I think it's so important. I think part of it for you is is starting to think about, you know, not just your act on stage, but the things that we do off stage, mm -hmm. and then that'll inform what you do on stage. You know, as your comedy grows and your life evolves, you might not want to talk about the same things you're talking about now. You might want to talk about stuff that's bigger than your own life. Yes. You're informed by your own experiences, but it is kind of the next level for a comedian, you know, once you can cut through the personal and you are very vulnerable, mm -hmm. your, your act is vulnerable and your, your persona is you let people in to what you're thinking. Mm -hmm. And once you get, once you can conquer that, which is very brave and I'm not even sure I've done that, but you have, then it kind of opens you up to be able to talk about anything. Yeah, it's so true. I mean, it, it, it is what people start doing when they get to a certain level in stand up, I see so many comics doing that. And then people say, You're a comedian, stick to comedy. It's oh, it's the same thing every time. <laughs> Everything's comedy, so fuck that. <laughs> That's so true. You know, people say stick to comedy. It's like, well, what does that mean? I gotta like put banana peels on the floor. <laughs> like everyone's making political jokes. It's all that's left. Like, what if I yeah, if I wear like a red nose if I, when I talk about something, is that okay? I, Patch Adams. <laughs> Is there one thing you haven't done that you would want to do? Um, like in, meaning on TV or in a movie or anything is, or in your art, anything. <sighs> uh, lately, I used to think, yeah, I want to do this and I want to do that. But now as I, I don't know if there's an answer to that right now. I, yeah. I'm really proud of what I have done. And I think I'm using this downtime, if you want to call it downtime, to assess what I want to do next. Because I used mm -hmm. to say, I want to write movies. I want to direct movies. I went to film school. Maybe I'll write another book. Maybe, but but I'm not even sure of that. I'm not even sure of that anymore. I didn't know you went to, where'd you go to film school? Boston University. Oh, wow. That's great. Yeah. And I'm still friends with a lot of my college friends. And I, you know, I'm definitely in a, I don't know what the word is, an evolution, mm -hmm. you know, of like what's next. Maybe it's, maybe it's coming out even harder than I've ever come out with my standup, or maybe it's a softer play about my, me and my two rescue dogs. That, that, that's, that would be good for family entertainment. Maybe, 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 maybe my comedy is going to evolve and maybe I'm going to leave it behind and do something else in my life. Like, you know, having the tour, we were supposed to do bumping mics at the beginning of quarantine. We canceled the whole tour, mm -hmm. Dave and I, and our Netflix series was supposed to be shooting. We moved it to August and then we moved it again to next August. Oh, wow. So all that downtime, it's nice to have something to look forward to, but I'm also like, maybe this is my hiatus year where yeah, read books and take care of my health and get in shape. And maybe it's like a Jeff year as opposed to a comedy year. Right. I just don't know. I think that's very important. And I think we deserve, you deserve that, Jeff. You've been working, working, working and plowing like 
uh, you work see I, we have something in common where I am a workhorse and I love creating things and if stuff isn't going on I'll create it like I'll find something to make happen mm-hmm. and you've been doing that for so many years so I think it's good to take some time to just relax and figure out what you want to do and enjoy like I, I went on a buddy's trip last weekend and just sort of live and yeah. eat food and I learned how to cook a little bit more than I did and I learned more about I'm reading a Johnny Cash's autobiography right now and I'm reading a book on raising German shepherds and stuff that I would never ever ever do when I was in the grind right so it was like well I got to do it the fans are wanting this and you know oh, oh. Paid to- hold on someone else wants to say hi Ooh. Another celebrity cameo. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Have you ever? This is Charlotte. Hi, Charlotte. This is one of my two year old twins. Oh my And God. Isabella. People, you should watch this on YouTube, guys. Okay, Charlotte, go take a bath. She's going to cry a little. It's okay. <laughs> Dad, you'll be there that, soon. That is the best ventriloquist dummy I've ever seen. I know, my hand is sopping wet. Oh, wait, hold on. They're texting me from the other room. Question. Oh, are the dogs coming back in? What is it, Ed? Sorry, guys. The mattress is the wrong size. (laughs) I'm sorry. This is hysterical. (laughs) (laughs) This is the craziest podcast I've done. (laughs) Oh, no, I got a delivery. Oh no! All right, listen, we're wrapping it up anyway. I. <laughs> oh, California king. You have a California king, but your frame isn't for a California king. This is incredible. Your frame is a regular king. I'll be. I'll be on this thing. All right, I, I tipped him out and told him to wait ten minutes. All right. <laughs> I can't even deal with what's going on. The 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 mattress at your cousins there, the dogs, the, my kids. Listen, it's great. It's a. <laughs> Can we do what was it? Wife swap? Could I come take care of your house? <laughs> take care of my house? I, we should, Jeff. That would be amazing. <laughs> I love you so much. I'm so grateful that you did this. And right. um, this is cathartic was... for me. This is what I love. This is how I like staying yeah. in touch with people. This is a great way to talk to the fans. I love your podcast. Thank and... you, Jeff. I adore you, JK. I adore you. I adore you, JR. And we'll we'll talk very soon. I hope the mattress thing works out. I hope the delivery guy has an arm. And uh, and I wish you all the best. We'll talk soon. And thank you again. Lots of love, Jessica. You too. Okay. Bye, everybody. Bye.